And next up, we have uh, Laurent Falquier, who will present the Innovative Resource Award. Okay, thank you th all for being here. And I would like first to thank the other member of the jury and to say that uh, we had a nice time discussing the different applications and that we all agreed on the ranking that we decided. And following this ranking, we are delighted to attribute the SIB Innovative Resource Award uh, 2023 for his outstanding open genome browser to Thomas Roder. Okay, before he will tell you more about uh, Open Genome Browser, I will first have to define a bit more what is the Un Innovative Resource Award according to the SIB. So the Innovative Resource Award seeks to recognize an outstanding contribution in the field of bioinformatics, specifically in the development of innovative resources that significantly advance the capabilities and reach of our scientific community. This resource, database, infrastructure, code base, analysis framework, visualization tool, uh, breaking new conceptual and or technical ground encompasses original methodological contribution as well as innovative in silico analysis of biological sequence, structure or processes. Sounds a bit abstract, but uh, let's imagine you are a bioinformatics core facility manager and a user comes to your office with hundreds, if not thousands, of bacterial genomes to organize, to query, to visualize, and for example, for common pathways, and even more. You would probably freeze in front of such a challenge. Well, fortunately for you, Open Genome Browser would be the perfect tool to help you in such a situation. As Thomas Roder will show you in a moment, he developed a tool that provides you with an intuitive, versatile, and open source platform allowing for visualization and comparative analysis of complex genomic data. This is typically the kind of re innovative resource we like at SIB, because it is not only technically sound, but it is essential to provide support to non-bioinformaticians and let them explore their own data easily thanks to a user-friendly interface. It might look simple. However, the complexity lies in the details. Ask Thomas how to highlight a selected cake pathway on a graphical map combining 1,000 genomes. <laughs> Thomas developed his resources during his PhD thesis in the group of Dr. Remy Brugman at University of Bern, and he's committed to uh, maintain and further develop it over the next years, as he will stay in the group. He also developed other tools like SCORI2. But despite his huge work during his PhD, he hasn't lost his well-known appetite as he can still eat two desserts at every lunch. <laughs> 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 Finally, he doesn't leave his Bernie's root behind because he recently became CEO of a startup called Abrinka, named after the RA River. His company aims at securing funding via licensing his open source browser to commercial companies. Thomas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Laurent, for this lovely introduction. And thanks a lot to the SIP for giving me this great award. It's a very great honor. Um, thanks also to the committee, especially those that voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so I, I was uh, a bit surprised to, to, to get an award for my software because, because I was uh, slightly afraid um, during the work on it um, that it doesn't really include a new algorithm or, a new, or new biological findings. Um, 
and this is, these are all often preconditions for getting published and recognized. Um, I was considering myself to be developing something like a public infrastructure. Um, yeah, so I'm really thankful uh, to the SIP for having this award to honor um, maybe less traditional research projects like uh, resources like Open Genome Browser. <clears throat> Right, so since my software only was released uh, in December of last year, I assume that most of you haven't heard of it, so, and you don't understand what it actually does, so let's change that. Um, Open Genome Browser is a comparative genomic software for uh, simpler genomes like bacteria, fungi, and archaea. Um, there are huge amounts of, of uh, data available for these organisms, because nowadays they can be produced uh, very uh, cheaply. But the major bottleneck has become um, storing, organizing, accessing, exploring, comparing, and sharing this data. <clears throat> um, this was really frustrating for me at the start of my PhD. Um, and I found this really cumbersome. So this is a semi-fictional exchange that, uh, with a, between a biologist and a bioinformatician. So the biologist might uh, be interested in a certain bacterium, and he wonder, she wonders whether it can pre produce folate. And the bioinformatician then maybe uploads the genome to the Keck servers in Japan and maybe waits a few hours or a day until the data gets back. And then he checks whether all, all of the genes are there, and he, he finds that one of them is missing. And so he says, no, it can probably not produce this compound. The biologist is then not very happy because she, she was looking forward, she was searching for a bacterium that can do this. So, <laughs> so, uh, so she asks, well, which of my bacteria in my database can produce folate? And then the bioinformatician has to do a bit more work. Maybe he annotates all of the genomes with eggnog and creates these maps automatically using uh, PathView, let's say. And he sends the data back. And the bio biologist then performs some experiments. And maybe she finds that. Uh, one of the bacteria, even though the maps indicate it has all of the necessary genes, it cannot produce folate anyway, and then asks the bioinformatician to find uh, an explanation. Um, and the, the bioinformatician then maybe compares the relevant genes and maybe finds a mutation that correlates with the phenotype. And then uh, you might think that both of them are really happy because they learned something and they came to a result. However, they might, uh, this, my, this exchange might have been very frustrating for both of them. For the biologist, because each of these simple questions may have taken hours or even days um, uh, for, to get an answer for. And for the bioinformatician, it might have been really tedious and boring work. <clears throat> so this brings us to the ideas behind Open Genome Browser. Uh, the main uh, idea is that the bioinformatician focuses on pre-processing the data and loading it into the software. And the biologist can then answer, uh, pose at least some of, some of her questions directly to the software and get immediate results. And this would then both, make both of them happy. <laughs> and so these are the, the main features um, of my software. It can create phylogenetic trees. It can create um, pathway maps. You can use it to compare genes and search for annotations. Uh, it can produce dot plots, which uh, help you identify structural differences between assemblies, as well as flower plots, which help um, users to find genes or orthogenes that are shared by a set of genomes or that are unique to certain genomes. Um, and it also has a gene trait matching feature, so if some of your bacteria have a certain trait and some don't, it will propose some candidate orthogenes uh, that, that correlate with, with the phenotype and that could be causally uh, causing the, the, uh, the phenotype. So you might want to then perform an experiment to confirm it. Right. And without further ado, I'd like to um, demonstrate two of my favorite features of the software, the pathways and the gene comparison tools. I hope um, I need my, the help of our technician. I, I think she's ready. Yes, so let's open opengenomebrowser.bioinformatics.unib.ch. This is the demo server of the software. Please pause. And uh, it contains um, uh, about 60 lactic acid bacteria, most of them, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> That's sorry. I have to f push on the laser button, not the other one. <laughs> yeah, most of them are Propione bacterium for, for the Reichi, as you can see here. Um, continue, please. Yeah, so 70, 67 and 44 Freudenreichi. Now let's go to the pathways tool like this. And here we can enter the name of a pathway map, for example, glycolysis. And below that, um, we can enter a genome, for example, this one, just randomly, and then click on the submit button. Pause, please. And here what we see is uh, which enzymatic steps on the pathway are covered by the genome. genome. <clears throat> Please continue. But we can also um, do more complicated inputs. For example, we can write at tax um, actinobacteria. Pause, please. And then we see not just red shapes, but also yellow ones. And the, the color represents the fraction of the genomes that have the required genes to perform this um, step. So these are all of the actinobacteria have have um, the genes for this step, but only some have the genes for this one. Continue, please. Um, but the tool is even better. You can click on Add Groups, and then you can compare the first group of genomes to a second group, like this. So for example, comparing actinobacteria with Firmicutes. Pause, please, again. Thank you. Um, and here now you see that the, the shapes are split into two parts, for example, this one here. On the left side, it's yellow, that, which indicates that only some of the firmicutes have the required genes. And on the right side, it's red, meaning that all of the, no, the other way around, <laughs> all of the firmicutes have it, but only some of the actinobacteria. And continue, please. Yeah, and uh, you can click on these shapes, like this. Mm. Yes. And then you see which of the genomes are positive and which ones are negative. And you can click on the annotations that are covered and go to the, to the compare the genes tool. And um, so here are the genes um, of interest that, were, that we saw in the pathway map, basically. Um, pause, please. And uh, with one click, we can create, calculate the protein sequence alignment. And if we went to the settings bar over here, we could also um, compute a nucleotide sequence alignment with different um, alignment algorithms and so on. And below that, we have a gene locus plot. Um, continue, please. Yeah, pause. Um, what we see here is um, each of these plots is, a, is an excerpt of, of, a, of, of a genome assembly, and, and, and the bars, these are the genes. So the, the green one, the, the gray ones in the middle are the genes of interest. And we see, um, and they're colored according to their ortho group. So in this genome here, Lactococcus cremoris, and in this genome, Lactococcus lactis, we see that our gene of interest is flanked uh, with, with the same genes. So this is in certain uh, context uh, relevant information. For example, if you have a hypothetical gene, you might be able to get an idea with what it does by looking at its neighbors. Um, continue, please. <coughs> uh, you can zoom in and out. And you can click on these um, genes as well to see, um, in, to get information about them. For example, this is a fructose biphosphatase, and its neighbor is a uh, uh, an oxyreductase, and of course the, the one that is green in the other plot as well has the same description. Yes, uh, if you want to play around with the software, you could go to opengenomebrowser.bioinformatics.univ.ch yourself. Um, and if you want to learn how the tools work and how to use them, you could go to opengenomebrowser.github.io, where I have also documentation and uh, tutorials on how to install the software and so on, and also the, the tutorials about the, the tools. <clears throat> so um, why Open Genome Browser? Surely similar tools already existed before, but I think it, one of my main innovations is that it's a, a reusable and dataset independent software. So many other tools have been made specifically in the context of a, of a certain sequencing project, and very little, if none, was made to make, make the software easy to recycle or reinstall for your own data. 
And I think this is what makes it sustainable because um, theoretically lots of people can use my software, but only one code base have, has to be developed and maintained. Um, moreover, Open Genome Browser contains tools to help you organize the genomic data, which is very important for long-term sequencing projects, which, which can spend decades and involve different uh, methods of data processing, as well as um, read generation. Um, and in my slightly biased opinion, I think it's more feature-rich and much more user-friendly than, than uh, alternatives. <laughs> and together that means it could uh, greatly accelerate your research and save you some money. <laughs> Right, so what are the, uh, maybe I should skip this slide. What are some of the use cases of Open Genome Browser? So firstly, it's obviously um, useful for non-programmers because it's important that they can look at their own data. They often know the biological context, which is often super important. And it offers them new ways of doing this, w yeah, which could be very significant. But it's also um, useful for non-bioinformaticians who either they might want to use it themselves, it also makes them faster, but also because it helps them systematically um, manage their data and including the metadata. <clears throat> and uh, for sequencing projects, it, it's uh, basically this was the use case for which it was developed. Um, large scale sequencing projects need to have a central way of storing the data systematically and they usually want to make it ex easily accessible to many different people in their institution. And it could be useful for bioinformatics providers who might want to give end-to-end um, -end services. So from the raw data that they receive from a sequencing center all the way to assembly annotation to open genome browser to give it to their clients in a more high value or more readily use usable format. Could also be used for to publish data sets. So if you sequence lots of genomes and uh, you, you, could, you could make them available very, very neatly by simply by recycling my software. And it, could also be, it has also been used in education because it's quite easy to use. So um, uh, I'll give you a brief idea of some institutions that use the software. So we developed it together with Acroscope for their database of 1,500 um, lactic acid bacteria. And by now, um, I think uh, four groups are using it at the University of Bern, mostly um, in the field of veterinary bacteriology to study uh, animal pathogens. But I'm, I know that some other projects are being planned, including outside of Switzerland, and there has even been some commercial interest, though I'm not allowed to disclose much more on this front yet. <laughs> right, so we're coming to the end. I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, Simon Oberhansli, uh, Noam Shami from Agroscope, and my PhD supervisor, Remy Bruckmann, as well as the, the institutions that supported and uh, funded my PhD program during which I wrote the software. And I'd like to mention um, the spin off that I created called Abrinca Genomics, together with Remy, my, my PhD supervisor, and Linda, computer scientist, with the goal to ensure long term uh, maintenance and support and development for the software. Yeah, this is the end of the presentation. I didn't have one minute left. <laughs> uh, thank you for your attention, and many thanks again to the SIP for this lovely award. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take a few questions. If, you, if you're interested in the software, please, please talk to me later on. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, questions for Thomas? Thank you. Um, so as far as I understand, uh, the, so the software is um, based on bacterial genome assemblies. Is that correct? So, mm. well, so you, you not just the bacterial genome assemblies, so it could be also different organisms as long as they don't have introns, more or less. Um, but right. you also have to pre-process the data. I think this is an important realization. You cannot, um, you cannot force everyone to use the same pipelines. In, in, in one instance, people might be interested in, let's say, antibiotic resistance genes, and in another instance, in, let's say, carbohydrate uh, metabolism. So um, 
my software uh, requires you to, to, to assemble your, your genomes and then to annotate them, for example, using Eggnog or other tools, but you can define those freely yourself. You just have to follow some basic um, formatting instructions and then you can load this data into my software. I hope that answers your question. Right, so basically the input is an annotated genome or a, or a set of annotated bacteria, or let's say a set, a set of annotated yes. genomes, set of, annotated genomes. of <laughs> organisms that do not have splicing. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Now it's working. And yes, Laurent, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, part of, of this you already answered, but I, I was wondering if you could potentially add uh, other annotations, like, for example, an anti smash annotation for bacteria. Yes, I've experimented with, with anti smash in particular. I think I haven't, but with Vibrant, which gives you a similar output. So it annotates a region of the genome with, um, with pot as potential prophages. And anti smash would annotate a certain region with as potential biochemical gene clusters, right? So this would just be a type of annotation that assigns um, a class like a, let's say a um, lipid acid uh, or something, a gene cluster to certain, a certain range of genes. And you could then use them and, um, in, in the software as an, a type of annotation. Any further questions for Thomas? Okay, I think we're all getting hungry as we're running a little bit over, over time. <laughs> so uh, please, uh, a big round of applause again for uh, Thomas. And then before you run off, just to uh, thank uh, once again, all the members of the juries for uh, uh, undergoing this uh, arduous task of selecting uh, the awards for this year. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, yes, uh, for the next edition, please make sure to share the call widely, and uh, when you receive an email from us asking to uh, serve on one of our juries, uh, please do consider it. A round of applause for all of our laureates this year. Thank you. Thank you.